Welcome to Walk in Truth Christian Fellowship Church, where faith meets community. Our fantastic Bible study sessions are more than just learning. They're a journey of faith and enlightenment. We engage with the scriptures in a profound way, connecting with people across the globe through our dynamic outreach programs. Our teaching and preaching inspire transformation, reaching hearts from all corners of the world. Whether you're joining us in person or online, you'll find a warm, inclusive environment. Join us at Walk in Truth Christian Fellowship Church, where your journey of faith is supported every step of the way. Together, let's walk in truth. chapter, Jesus tells us that there's no greater love than this, that someone lays down his life for his friends. Jesus also tells us that if we obey his word, we are no longer called his servants. We are called his friends. Amen. 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 Who am I that you are mindful of me, that you hear me? When I call, is it true that you are thinking of me? How you love me? It's amazing. Who am I that you are mindful of me? That you hear me? When I call, is it true that you are thinking of me, how you love me? It's amazing. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a 
friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. I am a friend of God. 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 He calls me friend. Thank you for coming and spending this time with us because you can be doing anything else. But we hope that we pray that this service will uplift you and inspire you. So first we're going to do, we're going to go into prayer. Then we're going to have a word of exhortation from Brother Marvin. Then we're going to have Sister Joyce uh, read, read a passage. A real, uh, and then we're going to get started. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Oh, well, Grace Heavenly Father, I just thank you. I thank you for today. I thank you for the opportunity to share and to fellowship one more time with the saints. Lord, we are better together than apart. The Lord continue to teach us how to bind ourselves in the love and in the blood with cords of love that cannot be broken. Lord, if there's anything that's hindering us from hearing what you say today, Lord, we ask that we crucify it right now in the name of Jesus, Lord. Open our hearts and open our minds to the word that's going to be taught today and open our hearts to the spirit of one another that we may love on each other, Lord, because you said, Lord, that they will know that you are his disciples because of the way we love each other. So, Lord, today, teach us how to love and teach us how to understand one another. And more importantly, Lord, teach us how to understand your word. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Are you a friend of God? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. A friend of God. Yes. 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 Yes.
with just how I was brought up. You hear more when you don't talk. You can't hear while you're talking. So I listen more and I learn more. I don't always say more. But on that prayer line, Pastor made a request. And it just hit my spirit. Oh, man. So I have been thinking about it ever since. I tried to put into words what walking truth ministries mean to me. Amen. So bear with me. Amen. I first met Pastor Sutton when he came to my old church. The first thing I noticed about him is his good looks. Amen. The other ladies know this too. <laughs> and when he was introduced as a minister, my first thought was, he won't be a minister long. <laughs> the ladies gravitated toward him. But he stuck with his calling and purpose. Come on. Amen. Amen. Come on. He was on a mission. He started a daytime Bible study for those of us who preferred not to have to come out in the evening. Some of us are still with him on the morning days, you know, Bible study. Later on, as we grew, he added an evening Bible study both on Tuesdays, one in the morning, one in the evening. His manner of teaching the scriptures is line by line, and verse by verse. He is patient and thorough. He really wants you to get this, his word. Now around the same time, he had a, started a radio ministry and broadcast, you know? And he often tells us he is our God, not our God. That's one of his favorite phrases. That's true. <laughs> he wants us to look at him as a fellow sufferer in Christ. Yes. Amen. 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 Yes. Little did he know that God had bigger things. Hallelujah. Oh. He had bigger plans for him. Oh. In 2015, he was installed as a pastor at Walking Truth Christian Fellowship Church. Mm -hmm. It is very active today with supporters and members around the world. He also supports two, two churches in Africa. Mm -hmm. Pastor Sutton is very true to his calling. Jesus. I have followed him from the beginning and he has made a difference in my life. Amen. Yes. 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 Pastor Sutton started a prayer line during the pandemic mm -hmm. so that we could still commune with each other and God when we couldn't have no physical contact with mm -hmm. each other. Mm -hmm. The prayer line is still active on Thursday evening at 7 p.m. Yes. <laughs> he also teaches us that the Bible gets smaller as you study and your understanding gets easier. Amen. The Bible is still big to me. <laughs> but as I stay committed, it starts to shrink. Come on. Yeah. Amen. Okay. Mm. You know, my pastor has many titles. Son, brother, husband, father, uncle, nephew, <laughs> friend, Sister, ooh. <laughs> 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 
I just want to say thank you, Dr. Sutton. That's one of his other titles. Doctor, pastor, teacher, God. I just want to thank you for all you do for us. Amen. And Christ. Amen. Yes. 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 Glory to God. You know, I, I find a scripture that starts with your first name, James. James 1, <laughs> verse 12. That's how I describe you. You know, you always say you want to get. Thinking people say, say you people think. Amen. And you've been on a mission. I love you much, and I thank you for your patience and guidance. Mm. Yeah. Yes. There's a crown in heaven for you. Oh, Jesus. 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 Thank you for bringing us all together. Yes. Yes. With the knowledge of Christ. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Thank you for tuning into the Walk in Truth Radio Network broadcast. Grab your Bible, get settled, and let's walk through the Word of God together. Let us now reason together and listen to see what God is saying to us today. church but Joyce and Mother Golson in particular Joyce especially I remember when we first started teaching uh, midday Bible study Joyce has been to all of my classes every last one of them and I'm not talking about just the Bible study I'm talking about the side classes I would teach she would be there Mother Golson would be there the mirror would be there if she could you know and others um, and they've been with me ever since amen amen truly truly you know, the blessing is watching each one of you grow and watching Joyce grow. Yeah, the Bible is big, but as you continue to study, the Bible's still big. It becomes smaller to you. And that's a lifelong pursuit of mine. Again, I didn't I didn't I didn't call myself into the ministry. God called me into the ministry. And I didn't call myself a pastor. They called me their pastor. That's the difference. See, when you do the work. And God will bring somebody to confirm the work you're doing with the title that goes along with the work. Amen. Just remember that one. If you're too eager to become a pastor, you need to run away from that pastor because it's 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 a it's a it's a a great responsibility, and it makes everything else pale in comparison. Okay. And my only job description is that I rightly divide the word of truth. The rest of it is character. And as you continue to learn the character of God, you develop the characters of God because you're being conformed to his image. There's nothing good in me except the Holy Spirit. Anything that's in my flesh is no good. And anything that I do, I do because it's in me to do whether evil or good, but the good is God that's in me. Paul even said he was in a quandary. Why do I do the things that I know that I should not do or the things I should do, I don't do? Oh, what a wretched man that I am. Who can save me from this body of death? And it was God through the cross that saved him. Amen. 
And as we unpack the cross every day, we realize the awesomeness of it, the power that was received from it. And then when he rose him from the dead, he said, neither death nor life, nor angel, nor principality, nor things present, nor things to come shall separate you from the love of God. Amen. See, there's nothing that can outside of me because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. So any problem is not with the world, it's not with Satan, it's not with the demons, it's not with the angels, it's not with the problems. The problem is my perspective about what I go through on this fallen world. Mm -hmm. And I can be more than an overcomer through Christ who strengthens me. Mm -hmm. So I understand what I've been through, but I tell you what, what I've been through is all for the glory of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 All right, let's open up our Bibles to... Uh, Mark chapter 2. Just put a pen in it right there for a minute. As uh, I spoke at the Misfits and I spoke in Peoria, what I will always tell you for those who, is, who are called to preach and teach, each audience, you can use the same scriptures, but you what you will end up doing is the Holy Spirit will guide you into what you want to, what is going to be said before those people. It's a little different every time. And I, I, it's kind of, I went back to what we have moved on from, and we really moved on from about learning how to suffer well. But more importantly, we have to understand how our faith plays an important role in our lives. How faith plays a more important role in our lives. Yes, miracles and signs and wonders and all that stuff that we really marvel at. But have you ever took the time to marvel at your faith? Have you took the time to really unpack how great your faith is and how precious it is to God? So we have to, at times, take a step back before we go forward. And this familiar passage, I'm going to show you something that you, that you pay a little attention to, but you need to pay a lot of attention to. Because guess what? We can't get through this thing alone. Amen. We need each other. Yes. And the day I figure I don't need you is the day I fall. Amen. And it's not that we're not going to have conflicts and difficulties, but I can never say I don't need everyone in this room. Because it's because of everyone in this room, I'm standing here. Because there'd be no reason for me to stand here without you guys love, you guys patience, and you guys is faith. And of course, your prayers. So let's dive into Mark and let's see what we're going to pull out of it today. Amen? Amen. All right, Steve. Mark 2, starting at verse 1. And when he re returned to Capernaum, after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together, so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts. Mm -hmm. Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately, Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they questioned this within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Amen. Amen. Now, you know, normally people hype on the fact that he took up his bed and walked, right? Yeah. 
that's like everybody runs to that. And like, oh my God, he took up his bed and walked. You know, he, he, he got lifted from the thing that afflicted him. And, you know, they sensationalize it. And it's good to talk about that. But there's something that's so simple right in front of you that you mm -hmm. miss. It was the four friends that bought him. Mm -hmm. Jesus was amazed at their faith. The Pharisees were looking at the miracle, but they missed the faith. Mm -hmm. They're looking at something they could see, but they, they, they didn't pay attention to what caused the situation to happen was four men who had faith and believed from afar that this man, their friend, needed to get to Jesus. Mm -hmm. What they did was come together to share their faith to get their friend who was afflicted to get to Jesus so their friend could possibly be comforted. Amen. And they weren't deterred by the crowd because their faith made them improvise and decide, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get our friend to Jesus. Amen. So I want to talk about the faith mm -hmm. that is shared. Because when you share your faith, you're, you're, what you're doing is you're sharing what you know about Jesus and your communion with Jesus over the time you walk with him. So when I share my faith, there's a possibility that that person I'm sharing with, that I'm witnessing to, they will come to a saving knowledge of God. But when we all get together, where two or three are gathered, he's in the midst. Why do we gather? We gather in faith. And then that faith to our gathering requires an action. The action of trust was they got up and did something about their sick friend. Yes. What they did was step into his affliction. They stepped into his problem. They were his legs when he could not move. They was his hands that could not work. They were what he needed to get to God. And we have to start working our faith and start getting people to the God that wants to cure them. But God is putting these people in front of you to test your faith, to test your trust. And are you willing mm, to commune with God as he communed with you when you was under affliction? Mm, Jesus. Wow. Jesus. Mm. Thank he marveled at their faith. Yeah, everybody else is there to go to church, do their religious stuff. Pharisees were there to kind of catch Jesus up. But it made no difference why they were there. See, two things could be going on at once, and sometimes we miss the greater thing. And I think the greater thing was their faith. Amen. That set the stage for the miracle. Amen. I can imagine that morning, they said, I heard Jesus is going to be at home today. And they're like, well, what you want to do? They say, well, uh, I'm going to call him Billy. Well, Billy, you know, Billy's been sick for a long time. He's a paraplegic. He, he, he can't move. He's been laying on his cot. You know, we've been taking care of him. We've been helping him in his affliction. But we know, we've heard about this Jesus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we just, may, we just believe that if we can just get him to Jesus, <coughs> that Jesus will heal him. Because, you know, I heard that he healed a lady with the issue of blood. I heard that he raised somebody from the dead. I even heard that he cast out demons. So if he can do all that, possibly, could he help our friend? Well, what drove them was the love of their friend. What drove them was the affliction that their friend was in, the, the circumstance, incident, accident their friend was in. We don't know why their friend was like that, but Jesus said, pick up your bed and walk. Don't say no more. We, what we have to understand is these situations are set up for us to demonstrate our faith and our trust in God, but it may not be on you, but it may be towards somebody else. Right. You keep asking for a miracle, but you're supposed to be the miracle for somebody else. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Why would God die and give you all this power when you sitting on the word about you? Mm. I'm thinking about everybody else. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm afflicted. Y'all know my affliction, but you don't know all of it. Me and Kay was riding yesterday. She went on to ask me about all the stuff was wrong. And I said, you know what? It don't make no difference how I'm afflicted because if I can get up before y'all and speak the word of God, it don't make no difference I can see or not see. I see spiritually. Jesus. This 
ain't me. This is the God in me. And when y'all do stuff for me, with me, that's also sharing your faith with me that fuels me to keep going. Amen. There's no reason to quit. You know why there's no reason to quit? Because I guarantee you, you're not going to be here one day beyond your assignment being completed. Amen. When it's time for me to go, my assignment is done. Like Paul said, I've been poured out like a drink offering. I know it's time for me to go. But there's times where Paul faced death. And he understood that he had gone as far as he can go. He has he has went as far as he can go. And a lot of us have to understand there's a point where you, in your own knowledge, in your own relationship with God, you have gone as far as you can go or what you've studied to go, and you can't go any further until you get to that point and continue to call on God. Remember what we said the other day? It said, when the righteous cry out, God hears them and delivers them out of all their troubles. Then we learn that the righteous are those in uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. It says, for his sake, he who knew no sin became sin for us, that by, we might be the righteousness of God. So let me reinterpret that. That means that he who knew no sin became what we are afflicted with so we can be the righteous of God. So he delivered us into the kingdom with imputed righteousness by what he did and what we have faith in. Your faith is always in Christ Amen. and the completed work on the cross. That you try to have faith in a whole bunch of other things other than the one thing you need to be focused on is the faith in the resurrection. And I haven't said no religious activity yet. These guys didn't get to participate with those praise and worship. They were too busy acting in faith bringing their friend to see Jesus. Wouldn't it be nice if we all bought in somebody that was afflicted? We don't need you to sing unless you want to. We don't need you to dance unless your feet is moved by God. But we bought you here to hear that what you could be delivered from. We bought you here because we got a church that cries out to God and God said he hears us and will deliver us out of all our troubles. Then it went on to say in Psalms 34, it said that God draws near to the brokenhearted. He draws near to the brokenhearted. And he saves those who are contrite in spirit. Now in our language, delivered and salvation saved is kind of synonymous, but in the Greek, it's just a little different. Delivered is the mechanism for delivering you from an outside home. I'll make it simple. But saved is more of a spiritual thing. God may deliver you from something that's happening to you, but that set you up so you can be saved. Amen. But a lot of times we miss that opportunity because we too we focus too much on being removed out of our issue versus praising the God who put us in the issue to look at him. So we must share in our afflictions. So we share in, our, share in God's glory. We must share in our afflictions that we may share in God's comfort. We must share in our afflictions that when our afflictions come to us that we've shared in, the saints of God will come beside us and we all divvy it out evenly. Just like when they, they sold all their goods and services and acts and laid it at the apostles' feet, the key to that scripture was with that act of faith, they had all things in common and nobody lacks. Well, think about it. If I share in my affliction and you partake in the faith as I'm going through my affliction, then I won't lack in God's ability to bring comfort into my life and you'll share in the comfort even though you're not the one afflicted. But you shared in my afflictions, meaning not that you're going to be afflicted with the same thing, but what you did was come aside me and encourage me and, 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 and talk to me and pray for me and comfort me and God says, you're sharing in their afflictions. So you get to share in the reward. You get to share in the comfort. You say, prove it to me, Pastor. I surely will. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. See, let's go on through 3 through 9. Okay. No, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Chapter 1. Chapter 1. Verses 3 through 9. 
starting at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Stop right there for a second, Steve. He's the Father of mercy and the God of what? All comfort. Just some comfort. All comfort. So we know the source to which our comfort comes from, and he has all of it, right? Yes. That means he's powerful, right? Yes. There's, there's nothing that can feed his the comfort, right? Yes. So then my question is, why are you walking in defeat when you serve a God of all comfort? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe you're not sharing in your afflictions. Mm -hmm. One reason they don't share in their afflictions, Sister Carol and is they got pride. Mm -hmm. I got, I've never met so many saints that got so much pride. And they try to hide it with their Christian lingo. <laughs> you can see it all in their face. Your ears about to pop open with so much pride. And they don't understand. That don't impress God. Pride don't impress God. But God talks about the fall that comes from pride and their haughty spirit. But we serve a God of all mercies and all comfort. Go ahead. Who comforts us in all our affliction. Now. He comforts us in some of our affliction. Oh. Oh. Mm. So the problem is not God. It's us it understanding that he comforts us in all our affliction. Yeah. Yeah. This got to be more than just words to you. Got to, you got to feel that. Yeah. All right? Now, he didn't say he comforts you once you get out. He said he comforts you while you're still in. So in other words... I can lay on the bed of, uh, bed of nails to be comforted by God. Mm, that's true. And I mean that figuratively. <laughs> <laughs> Not literally. I don't want nobody to go out there and talk about I'm going to make some nails and ask God to comfort me, you know? I'm going to make a posture Peter Matrick out of a bed of nails. No. Don't, don't, don't do that. Okay? I'm using the extreme to make a point. All right? So he comforts us in our afflictions. So what we see is at that point, if he comforts us in our afflictions, afflictions that whatever you're going through has been ordained by God. Okay. God has allowed you to make some bad decisions so he can comfort you. Amen. And the comfort, I want you to understand this, the comfort that he gives you is while you're in. And sometimes he wants you to be real comforted so he leaves you in. So you can learn a lesson of the affliction. And the reason, the other word for this is, if I'm being comforted during my affliction, that means he's teaching me how to endure it. The Bible says that we must endure hardness as a good soldier. So it's in the enduring that I'm, that I'm learning to be comforted in the situation until God changes it. He will only remove you once you've learned the lesson to glorify him and edify your brother and sister in Christ. So with those who are really afflicted with diseases and troubles and all this, that, and the other, that, 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 that really is not changing, you are the best candidates to, 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 to bring people into the comfort of God. Because people are going to wonder, how do you do what you do when you got so many ailments? Because wow. God comforted me. <laughs> he don't need to bring me out. I'm enjoying him while I'm in. I don't ask to be brought out. If if I, I know me like he's shown me. How many times have y'all said, y'all, if you got out of this situation, you weren't going to do it no more? <laughs> and go right back in and, and you double down in it. So God, if I can be in your comfort by being in affliction, let me just stay right here. Let me stay right before, because guess what? That affliction drives me to commune with you and communicate with you. Because I'm a righteous righteous person, I begin to cry out because I understand that he will, he became sin who knew no sins, that I could be the righteousness of God. You see how this all played together as, as a one coherent thought process? I can have imputed righteousness because he died for me and he gives that to me as a free gift for believing in what he accomplished on the cross, which is my salvation. And then I can walk in the power of the resurrection because he walks in, he walks in the power. So I was buried with him and I was raised with him so I can handle affliction. Without affliction, you have no Christ. Oh, wow. mm. Bulls and goats couldn't take away sin. They were just a band-aid. But when that high priest put his head on that, that lamb's head and then took out that sharp knife and cut that lamb's throat and that blood went everywhere, 
It was to show us, us how serious God takes sin. When God poured his wrath out on his son, it shows us how serious God took sin. And we need to be thanking God that we have been delivered from our sin. Amen. Your biggest affliction is not sickness. It's not poverty. By his stripes, you have been healed. Without that blood dripping and them stripes being shed, you couldn't be saved. So if you're not walking in victory, it ain't the power. It's your understanding that you have access to the power. All right, go ahead, Steve. Who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. So that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. So I am afflicted, I am comforted, so I can comfort you in your affliction. That was the faith them guys gave. He said, I comfort you. Each individual gets comforted in your own personal affliction so that you can comfort somebody else in their own personal affliction. But see, you so focused on you, you missed that part. <laughs> Woe is me. It's all about me. Why is God taking me through this? I can't believe I'm going through this. Why can't you believe in it? Oh, you thought when you got saved, you weren't going to have no issue? You, you, you thought your bad attitude was going to just disappear like that? No, that, that ain't how this works. You got to work on your sanctification. It's a growing process on some of these things that's in you. So God is trying to comfort you while you're afflicted with you. But you have to see it that way. All right? So we are afflicted and comforted so we can help those who are in affliction. Mm -hmm. Now remember up in Peoria, I gave you Job 36, 15. Mm -hmm. Now check this out. It says that, that uh, God delivers the afflicted in their affliction and then opens their ears by the adversity. Mm -hmm. Now think about what I just said. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that is intrinsically good about what I just said. But the good is, the promise of comfort comes from the fact God afflicts us in our affliction and opens our ears through adversity. There's something to be gained by this. This is deeper than, than me saying it. You have to understand, and what I'm the kind of person, and I tell people this, if I understand something, then I can deal with it. And understand it don't mean I agree with it. Mm -hmm. Understand is when I led up to the word of God, God tells me what it's supposed to do. <clears throat> I leave my imaginations at home. And I say, God, you ruled on this and this is how I'm supposed to feel, this is how I'm supposed to think, and I'm not going to stray away from it, but I understand why you said it, but I haven't arrived yet. So I'm still afflicted with misunderstandings in God's word. So when God say you, when you, when you admit that, then God can come in and straighten you out. Amen. But when you think you know it all, <laughs> then that's when you don't know nothing. The more I know about the word of God, the less I know. Because it's bigger than my little pea brain. And it's only by the grace of God that I get any understanding, but you have to have a humble heart to get there. You can't do it from an arrogant point of view. I speak boldly because I speak boldly because I trust God. It's not arrogance, it's confidence. Because I have confidence in what God has shown me in his word. I'm not trying to deviate and figure out and all that stuff. Let's just stick to the scriptures. The power is in the word of God. Okay? All right, Steve, keep reading. With the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Mm -hmm. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings. As we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, what did it say? So through Christ, we share abundantly in comfort too. So it's through Christ that we share in the comfort. It's not comfort manufactured by you. It's a comfort that was paid for by Jesus. 
So the comfort that you get is through, through Christ Jesus. Where is it through Christ Jesus? On that cross. Where is it through Christ Jesus? In the resurrection. All that is part of you understanding where you derive your power to be comforted by. All right, go ahead. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. So in other words, when we come together and suffer together, and you patiently endure the suffering, then you can you also get the comfort. If you can't endure the suffering, you can't get endure the comfort. And it's when we do this. All right? Go ahead. Our hope for you is unshaken. For we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. So if we share in our sufferings, we share in the comfort. Let me put it this way. If we share in the pain, we share in the power. If we share in the glory, we share in the glory. If we share in what is bothering us, then we can get delivered by the cure of the word, which moves us into Christ. See, we, we have to get to the point where it's so simple to us. It's not all complicated, saints. It's not complicated. It's very easy, but we tend to try to grasp the bigger things and we haven't grasped the simple things. If you can't share in my comfort, my, 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 my affliction, and I'm not going to share in your affliction, I can't understand, I can't really have a relationship with God through what he afflicted through. Think about it. He was afflicted for our sake. So we share in that affliction in a way, imputed affliction. We weren't on the cross, but guess what? We got the power from the cross. Mm -hmm. It's called imputedness. He got our sin, we got his righteousness. He got the wrath, and we get the glory. And so why we can't we come alongside somebody? Not being nosy. Mm -hmm. Not being nosy. Mm -hmm. Not being nosy. Not Thank you, Marvin. <laughs> Some of you just want to know because you want to be nosy. Right. You're not coming alongside to, to share an affliction. You just want to know what's happening. <laughs> but if you ain't going to come to share my affliction, just stay away. If you're not coming to encourage me to help me through this, just just you'll know when you get to know. But saints have to be more personal. Brothers and sisters in Christ have to be more loving. All right. Now Paul's going to sum it up. Go ahead. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to be ignorant. Your Bible may say King James say ignorant. All right. Go ahead. Of the affliction we experienced in Asia. Now he's given a personal account of a something that happened to him. So he gave the doctrine. Now he's getting the narratives to which he applies the doctrine. So I want to get, I want to slow down with this point. You take the doctrine and apply it to the circumstance. You take the doctrine and apply it to the incident. You take the doctrine and apply it to the accident. You don't apply the accident, the incident, and the circumstance to the doctrine. You let the doctrine explain and, go, and, and explain your CIA or life. So Paul gave you the doctrine. Now he's given a personal experience where he used the doctrine to glorify God and edify man and to see the power. Watch. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Amen. 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 What Paul is saying is we had we were experiencing so much persecution, so much famine. And he'll, he'll break it down later in Corinthians. He, he's going to say, I have been shipwrecked. I have been this. I've been that. Mm -hmm. And he said he's boasting in it. And he said he's he he going to sound like a fool. Mm -hmm. But what Paul is saying here is. I've been through so much, and at one point, the people that I traveled with who were sharing in my affliction, we thought we were going to die. Now, nobody knows what he's talking about. People have speculated. But Paul is saying, we were at death, real death. We thought we were going to die. And then it clicked. 
It was like a light switch went on. And Paul went back to Psalms 34. It said, many of the affliction of the righteous, but the Lord would deliver them out of them all. He went back and he said, when the righteous cry for help, God will save them out of all their troubles. Because he didn't go back to what he just wrote. He's writing after the fact, and now he's writing about it, and he's lining it up with scripture that was in the Psalms. So it's when you go back that you get the comfort, and he applied that word to his situation, and he said, ah, I see now. This was put on me so I can truly trust God. Some of you are at that breaking point in certain things in your life and God is waiting for you patiently to say, you know what? I've done all I can. I've done all I can, Lord. I'm going to stand on as far as I've been and I feel like I'm defeated. I feel like I'm at the place of death. I feel like everybody's turned against me and the Lord is saying, yeah, they did. But I haven't turned against you. I said, I never leave you nor forsake you. And you have to lean into those things that God say and not just repeat them over and over again. You have to feel it down in your spirit. Uh, yes. Yes. Thank you. See, I can say it because it's in my spirit. Mm -hmm. It's not a mantra for me. It's the way I have to live because I'm afflicted. So God keeps me afflicted so I can remember what he said. Amen. He keeps things happening to this decaying body so I can remember what he said. It's not about this flesh. It's about my spirit. It's about my soul. It's about my eternity. This is just temporal. Some of you are still hanging on to this. Too much. Let your TV not work at home. Oh my God, I got it. You got seven of them. I got to go buy another one. Right. No, you don't. Throw that one in trash and look at number five. Right. right. Yes. <laughs> but, but that's how we are. We love our cars. We love our clothes. We love our food. And all of that is perishing. Even, G, even he described it as the food that go in your belly coming out somewhere else. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So don't, don't take stock in that. We have too much of a relationship with the temporal that is perishing versus the eternity which we're being destined into. Yeah, that's right. so the more I'm afflicted, the more I can walk away from this. That's right. Yes. 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 That's what I'm talking about. Yes, Lord. The more I'm afflicted, I can walk away from all this. Yes, I can walk away from being a pastor. <laughs> I can walk away from a minister. But God said he never leave me no forsaken. Yes. I'm not going to walk away from him. Matter of fact, each affliction that may come upon me brings me closer to being with him. And like Paul said, it'd be great for me to leave and be with God because that's better for me, but I'm still here for your sake. You still here for somebody else's sake. You're not here for you. Your assignment ain't over with. What's that pastor proving some more? You go to Philippians chapter 3. Verses 10 and 11. Philippians chapter 3, starting at verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings. Here we go. Share his sufferings. You know the power by sharing in his sufferings. Go. Becoming like him uh -huh. in his death. Becoming like him in his death through his sufferings. All right. That by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the death. So he's saying, Paul saying again then, by any means necessary that I may continue to be a soldier and attain the, what's promised to me because I've shared in Christ's sufferings. Mm -hmm. How do you share in Christ's sufferings? Keep going forward in Christ. Telling people about Christ. Mm -hmm. Telling people, giving people the gospel. That's how you go forward. You're going to be rejected. Quit trying to be accepted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Word that rejection, when you get a gospel, they say they hate you, they don't want to have nothing to you, they don't believe in what you said, they try to argue with you. Don't argue with no fool. You just gave them the keys to eternal life and they turn it away. That's on them. The minute that you give somebody the gospel coherently, where they can understand what you said, they don't have to agree with you, they, their clock is ticking at that point. Nobody goes to hell on the oops. God said, you gonna know. He said, He said, you're gonna be without an excuse. Well, I'm gonna be out of excuse because somewhere in your life you were given the gospel, and I probably gave it to you a couple of times. But you know what? After so long of me knocking at your door, I decided to do what you want to do. You don't want me, then fine. I'll turn you over to a reprobate mind. Yeah. To believe the things that you should not believe and do the things you should not do. I'm gonna turn you over to myths and fables. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna matter of fact, the Bible talks about in Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, about the uh, 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 spirit of delusion that's in this world. Mm -hmm. God said, I'm gonna send a strong spirit mm -hmm. of delusion. Why? Because they won't believe the way I want them to believe. Mm -hmm. They want to believe the way they want to believe. Mm -hmm. And that's unacceptable to God because you know why? His, his son died the way he had to die for you. All right? So we see that the suffering and the power go hand in hand. No suffering, no power. No affliction, no power. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection. And that resurrection is a power that can raise people from the dead. And there's no more dead person than a person who don't know Jesus. I'm not talking about these corpses that's in the ground. I'm talking about the walking dead who don't accept Jesus that are completely separated from God that are basically Ephesians chapter 2 type Christians or non-Christians. We once walked according to the prince of the air. No longer. So let's look at, uh, what is it, 2 Peter? 1 Peter, 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 13. Look at that one. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 13. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. There we go again. Sharing in Christ's sufferings and we rejoice. All right. That you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Now, have anybody been into a, uh, into a situation where they, they there was a reopening of a store or something? A grand reopening? Yeah. yeah. There's the opening, and then sometimes the store goes through managerial changes or ownership changes, mm -hmm. and they say it's going to be reopened. Mm -hmm. The operative word is they went through some changes, but they still going to open. Mm -hmm. So you say, Pastor, what do you mean? That's why we rejoice. Mm -hmm. Because those who rejoice are saying by rejoicing, they've been through something, and they stuck with God. Amen. So I rejoice because I've been through a change. I've been through a change. I'm not what I used to be. So I rejoice because he decided to change me. He decided to reveal himself to me. I didn't deserve it, but that's what he wanted for his glory. So he takes people who are afflicted, people who are rejected, people who are marginalized, and he can use them for his glory. So when I'm afflicted, I get to rejoice because I feel the power of God more now than I ever felt when I had everything right. But now I realize when I had everything right, I still had everything wrong. Because I focused on the physicality of who I am. The mental capacity of what I've learned. And I understand why Paul had come to the conclusion that he counted all as dumb in his relationship to God. Paul thought he had a relationship with God through Judaism. The religious ceremony. But when he got knocked off that horse and blinded. Afflicted. When he got afflicted. And had to be carried out to a street called Straight yes. and was told by somebody that, hey, somebody going to come and lay hands on you. Mm -hmm. But until then, you're going to commune with me. Mm -hmm. 
Not only did I take your natural sight, but now through your blindness, I'm going to give you insight. Amen. Through your affliction comes, here I come to be the light in a dark place. So Ananias say, Lord, I understand what you want me to do. But do you know who that is? <laughs> and that's a natural reaction. Yes, yes, yes. Let's not make everybody super saint float on a cloud. That's a natural reaction. You all say, I know what I'm doing. But when I'm going to tell you something, let me tell you something that you don't know. But what, Lord? I'm going to show him how much he's going to have to suffer for my sake. Okay. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Oh, better him than me. <laughs> let me get on up here and lay hands on this man. <laughs> right, let me get to walking. You ain't got to tell me no more, Lord. Which hand you want me to lay on? Do we need a little oil? Well, hey, I don't want that. And I can understand some of you don't want this. You don't want to be afflicted. That's natural. I'm not telling you to sit there and ask for affliction. <laughs> what I'm telling you is affliction has a purpose. Amen. Right. And through affliction, you have power. Yes. And through suffering through affliction, you're more like Christ then than you are at any other time. Amen. When you can suffer affliction and still forgive and still help people, you are just like Jesus. Amen. Some of you are afflicted with unforgiveness. <laughs> Cause I've been done two wrongs, but you ain't done. You ain't, hold up. You ain't done right enough to be righteous in your own right. Nope. Is everybody fault but mine? I was a good church going something, 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 something. something. Yeah, I did. No, that don't make you righteous. That just make you religious. What makes you fall? What makes you righteous is when you can really just say, Lord. What a wretched man or woman that I am. Yes. Come save me. I don't deserve you. I don't deserve your love. I deserve your wrath. There's some deep, dark iniquity inside of me that I, nobody knows, but you know. And it flares up every now and then. So God, please cleanse my heart. Please expose it to the light of your love. He said if we are faithful, that, that if we admit our sins, he is faithful to forgive us. So what do you got to lose? Nothing but that wretchedness. So let's continue on. Let's go to Romans. Chapter 8. Verse 17 and 18. Huh? No, 7 and 8? 17. 17 and 18. Romans 18 too. Okay. Romans 8, starting in verse 17. And if children, then heirs. Mm -hmm. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. So, now stop right there. If children, then heirs. And now we're fellow heirs with Christ. That's where you get the king's kid stuff from. So I want you to say, I'm a king's kid. I'm a king's kid. Now watch what happens because you're a king's kid. Go read. <laughs> Provided we suffer. Oh, 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 what's that word? Suffer. Provided that we do what? Suffer. suffer. I ain't never heard nobody say that. I'm a king's kid. We can bring down the, we can do all this. We can bring in the people to the kingdom. But it say you're a king's kid with a caveat that says provided. Meaning that you learn how to what? Suffer. And what? Provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Ah! So unless you're suffering, you're not a king's kid. Unless you're suffering, you can't glorify him. You think you're a king clear when you be naming it and claiming it. But you never claim that. It's, that that's written right there for you. Take a walk on the wild side. <laughs> and understand, provided means if we take upon our cross and follow him. Yes. The cross you bear 
is the cross you made. The cross he bore is the cross we made. That's why it says provided that you suffer with him. And then in Luke, I'm going to show you what faith, what God said. What is that? Luke chapter 7, 9. Yes, 7, verse 9. Luke chapter 7, verse 9. This is my last scripture. Now, this scripture is about a Gentile who Jesus noticed showed great faith. And not even in Israel did he see such great faith. See, sometimes God will let you see faith from somebody who you think is on the outside, but they're more inside than you are. You think they, you, you, you think, oh, they, they don't go to church. And then they come along and say something that's so wise and profound. What if somebody who don't go to church said that last scripture in 8, 9, 9 and 10 to you? Say, and come up to you and say, yeah, I understand you go to church and all that stuff. You do all that. He said, but do you suffer for his sake? And you'd be like, what you mean? Well, the, uh, uh, it says if you're a king's kid, it's provided that you suffer for his sake to show that, that to participate in his glory. Mm. Okay? Read, Steve. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him mm -hmm. and turning to the crowd that followed him said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. Mm. Not even in the people I chose. Have I found such great faith? Because this outsider understood. He understood the power of submission. He understood the power of authority. He understood humility. He even broke it down in military terms. He said, I am a man where people basically do what I tell them to do. And I recognize that you are somebody of authority. And I believe that if you say, you don't have to show up. If you just say that what I'm petitioning can't be solved, I'll believe it, have faith in it, trust it, go back home, and trust an expectation. Wow. But we miss this. But that centurion, to love his slave so much that he would petition God, he stepped into his affliction. He couldn't solve. They probably tried all kinds of medicines. But it wouldn't work. But somewhere or another, he heard about Jesus. Yes. And he loved his slave, his, his servant, so much that he said, get this message to me, Jesus. And he had faith in that person's affliction. And that person was delivered by the God that responds to faith by a movement of trust. So the question that we all must leave here with, am I sharing in my afflictions so that somebody else could be comforted? Am I sharing in my comfort in somebody else's affliction? Am I learning to be more like Christ through affliction and focus on him and his eternal power versus this short-term temporal existence? This is beyond me. But God is willing to work with you and through you. But you have to submit yourself to him. The Bible tells us to submit ourselves one to another. It's not there that you got to bow down. You look at submitting as negative. But submitting is humility. And God can always work in a humble heart. He can't work in a haughty heart. God can always work with someone whose heart is broken, not who one who said got it all together. God says he comes to, to be with those who are contrite in spirit, not one who's on a spiritual high. It's funny to me that Paul said, I will also boast in more of my weakness so that the power of God can rest upon me. That's in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So, Lord, I want the Spirit of God to rest upon me and teach me how to endure the afflictions so I might show somebody the comfort of God. Yes. And we can all share together in that comfort. Let's pray. Grace Heavenly Father, I just thank you today. I thank you for my afflictions. I thank you for our afflictions. 
Well, you made it plain that if we share in our sufferings, we're more like you. And Lord, teach us how to share in each other's sufferings, that we might share in each other's comfort as most of us stay in some kind of affliction. Let us not look at the affliction as a negative thing, but look at the affliction as an opportunity. Lord, an opportunity to commune and communicate with you. Sometimes, Lord, you slow us, slow us down so you can speed up your relationship with us. So, Lord, let us look at the next time we're laying on our sick bed as an opportunity to say hallelujah and thank you, Jesus. When the doctors and the nurses walk in, oh, Father God, they see us praising God to the point that the, the Holy Spirit is so strong that they just have to leave and come back later. Lord, because the Spirit of God is moving and the Spirit of God can do more than any doctor can. Yes. So, Lord, I just thank you today. I thank you for the ongoing lesson on how to suffer well. Yes, Through all the sufferings and all the afflictions and all the turmoil of this fallen world, Lord, I have a choice. Before you came into my life, before you saved me, before you opened my heart to you, Lord, I didn't have a choice. But now I have a choice. And I choose you. As far as me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Amen. Bless us, oh Father God. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 All right. Amen. Yes. Amen. We always want you to be encouraged, blessed, and at peace and do what? Walk, Walk in truth. Amen. All right. Thank you for tuning in to the Walk in Truth Christian Fellowship Church broadcast on the WITRN network. Come join us every Sunday at 9 a.m. Central Standard Time for Sunday worship. Bible study is held on Tuesdays at 11 a.m and 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. We are located at 3006 North Lindbergh Boulevard Suite 711, St. Louis, Missouri, 63074. All are welcome and we look forward to seeing you soon.